Thanks so much, Vincent. And thank you everyone for joining today. Um, I'm really excited about this opportunity to talk with you about what we're learning about aggression in people with autism. So we're gonna to start today with some basic definitions of aggression, and then we're gonna talk about what we know about aggression in general, as well as in individuals with autism. And then at the end of the talk, talk we're gonna wrap, wrap up with some information about effective treatments and strategies for addressing these challenges. So let's go ahead and start with some basic definitions. Since the talk today is gonna to be on aggression, I thought it would be important to start with some definitions of that term itself. When people use the word aggression, it can mean a lot of different things and people will use it to describe lots of different types of behaviors. Um, you could say that a salesman was really aggressive in pitching his or her products, or you might describe your partner's driving style as being overly aggressive, um, or you may have a basketball team that has an aggressive style of defense. So those definitions are definitely accurate definitions of aggression, and they have to do with pursuing your aims or interests really forcefully. But for today's talk, we're gonna be focusing on a much narrower definition, and the definition we're gonna to use today is referring to a behavior that's aimed at harming or injuring another person. So you can see that that's a much more narrow, specific definition um, of the behavior. But as you know, um, from that definition, it really implies that the act of aggression was intentional. And that can be really difficult to measure. Um, it's really hard to read somebody else's mind. And it's hard to always know whether a behavior was intended to have an effect. But in general, when we think about aggression, we are, think of it differently from an accident or from a behavior that was unintentional or maybe accidentally hurt someone else, like bumping into somebody or elbowing somebody by accident. So this is the definition that we're gonna be using fairly loosely today. Um, I wanna point out that aggression can be um, defined differently and can take on some different forms, even within this definition. So aggression, even within this narrow definition can have different forms. And those can include physical aggression, which is gonna be the focus of today's talk. And that can include physical acts of harm, including biting, attacking someone, um, hitting or shoving or kicking, um, things that are pretty overt and easy to identify. But aggression can also include things like verbal aggression. Um, you know, you can think about screaming or yelling insults and things like that, that are behaviors that are intended to harm someone else, even though not physically harming them. And so verbal aggression is a form of aggression that we can think about as well. Those two types of aggression are what we think of as overt forms of aggression or things that can be easily observed and identified. Um, but people can also engage in more subtle or covert, covert forms of aggression. Um, and there's a term called relational aggression that we use to think about those behaviors. And so, for example, I'd like for you to think if you've seen the movie Mean Girls, you've seen um, relational aggression in action. And that's really behavior that is more um, gossip or social exclusion, those kinds of things that are intended to harm other people really by damaging their reputations, not so much by physically harming them. So these are three types or forms of aggression that we can observe. Um, even though all of those things can happen in someone's life and can have a negative impact, um, and I think they're all very important to understand, today we're gonna to be focusing really most closely on physical aggression um, or engaging in those behaviors that are physically harmful to somebody else, um, such as hitting or biting or shoving and those kinds of things. So we've talked about forms of aggression and what it might look like. I wanna also talk a little bit about some subtypes of aggression. Um, there's different ways that we can group aggression, but primarily there are two main subtypes that have been talked about in the literature. And those are reactive and proactive. And so I wanna spend just a few minutes now talking about what that means and why I think it's important to think about when we're considering aggression in autism. The first subtype or reactive aggression, I think of as kind of a hot tempered reaction. Um, it's considered to be a really defensive response um, to a perceived threat in the environment. Or if someone perceives that they're being provoked or threatened, um, it's an impulsive reaction. 
um, in general, reactive aggression is also thought to be hot tempered because it's characterized by um, physiological or biological arousal, um, which includes increased heart rate and kind of a bodily stress response. And so that's why we think of it as a hot um, emotional reaction. In addition to that bodily response, um, people who tend to react aggressively with this reactive subtype um, may also be perceiving things in their environment as being threatening. Um, they may be, in some cases, misinterpreting things as being hostile, even when they may not be. Um, so if somebody does that over time, if they continue to misperceive or um, view other things as being threatening in their environment, we call that a hostile attribution bias. And over time, that may lead them to behave aggressively because they're really just misinterpreting things um, in social situations. So that characterizes reactive aggression. And we're going to come back to this subtype um, throughout the talk. So I wanted to give some definitions early on. The other subtype that I want to talk about now is called proactive aggression. And that's kind of on the other end of the thermometer here when we think about hot tempered um, reactive aggression. Proactive is more of a cold tempered, um, almost a premeditated behavior in some ways. Um, and so in this case, we think about instead of an impulsive response with proactive aggression, it's much more of a planful, um, deliberate behavior that's aimed at achieving a goal. And so compared to the physical response of a hot tempered reaction in a proactive aggressive um, situation, we oftentimes see people having lower levels of arousal. And in some cases, there's some research to show that people who tend to show proactive aggression may actually engage in some behaviors as um, a way to stimulate and seek, seek more stimulation. So it's really fairly different from the reactive type. Um, and these behaviors, again, appear to be more planful and premeditated rather than impulsive or reactive. So I think it's important for us, um, especially in autism research, to be really specific and to think about potential underlying mechanisms that may explain why aggression is happening for an individual. And that can help us do a much better job of assessing it and for understanding how we might be able to address it um, if we know more about what it looks like um, kind of under the hood. So now that we've covered some of these basic definitions, um, I want to talk a little bit about how common aggression might be and, and why we're talking about it today together. So historically, um, you know, most of us, when we think about aggression, it's really not great and it's not that helpful. But if you think over time with um, the history of um, our human experience, aggression has been a normal and almost an adaptive part of our experience. Um, and in fact, if you think long, long ago, um, aggression may have helped us with survival. So it's played a pretty prominent role in history and across cultures um, over time. And even today in our society, um, some forms of aggression are still celebrated in American culture. So if you think about sports like football, where people are hitting each other all the time, um, to boxing, and even to popular culture in terms of song lyrics and shows and, and movies that depict physical violence, um, it is still definitely part of our culture. So why might that be the case? Um, well, I think aggression can be an adaptive response. So there are times when it might actually be very helpful for someone um, in terms of survival. So in the past, it may have allowed people to access resources that they needed to survive, or if somebody else, if resources were scarce, it helped them to co-opt somebody else's resources to help their family survive. Um, and then a second kind of adaptive function of aggression is a defense mechanism. So it's a defense against attack. And in that sense, it may help people to protect their homes and guard their homes from intruders or to protect their family or children from, from threats or attacks. So it's adaptive in that way. So we may be hardwired to have this aggressive response because it could be helpful to us for our survival. Um, and then even at a societal level, um, in some cultures and societies, aggression in some forms may help people increase their social status. Um, and you can see that, you know, thinking back to the relational aggression that 
seems to be more common in teenagers. Um, that generally is used to help people achieve social status and um, exert their power in social situations. And so, that, you know, you can think about these adaptive functions of aggression, um, but because now we live in a peaceful society, um, persistent aggression is really not adaptive. Um, even though aggression has served a purpose for us in human history, it's not all that helpful for us right now. And in most situations, it's gonna be maladaptive and, and harmful. Um, so when we take a look at aggression, just in the general population, um, it's, I think it's important to take a look and see how common this is and what it looks like over time. And actually we can see in typically developing children that there's a natural emergence of kind of instinctual aggression really early on, um, followed by a gradual unlearning of aggression over childhood. So I think it seems like there's a lot of parents on the call today. So if whether you're a parent of a child with autism or a parent of typically developing children or both, you probably know that aggression is pretty common in toddlers um, and that actually most toddlers show some form of aggression um, really early in childhood. And then over time across preschool, um, we see a decline in aggressive behaviors. So the peak of aggression tends to occur in toddlerhood. Um, and we can even see, you know, really young children, um, young toddlers demonstrating aggressive behaviors. Um, and then over time, as children learn to develop um, better communication skills and uh, an increased in ability to self-regulate, um, and they start to be able to take the perspectives of other people to understand that their behavior is not being well received, they start to learn those self-regulation skills that help them um, decrease aggression. So I think my point here is just to say that um, it's kind of a typical part of development to show aggression, but we expect to see children learning to develop skills to help um, manage that over time, typically. So I wanna show a graph now of a, a large longitudinal study um, that was conducted on children um, starting at age two all the way up to age 11. And when you're looking at this graph, what I want you to pay attention to are the top lines, the solid lines, um, the circles are girls and the diamonds are boys. And the solid lines are occasional aggression. So that's like once in a while demonstrating aggressive behaviors. And then the dotted lines at the very bottom um, are reflective of frequent or significant aggression. So I think the main point of this graph is to show you that occasional aggression, again, is really common in toddlers. So almost, you know, 40 to 50, close to 50% of two-year-olds are showing some aggression, uh, especially boys. Um, and you can see that that declines over time. So by age 11, um, it's very much less common. And the other take home point that I wanna just highlight here is that that's for occasional aggression, but when we think about frequent or significant aggression, that's actually really rare. So only about 5% of two-year-olds have frequent aggression and that declines um, closer to 0% by age 11. There is a small subgroup of children that remain um, highly aggressive, but it's a small population. Um, when we look at typically developing children. Um, so again, these data show a pretty consistent picture that some physical aggression is normal and expected of young children and that they start to show it almost as soon as they're physically able um, to sort of uh, um, demonstrate their, their needs and want, get their wants um, achieved. But that the behavior decreases in frequency over time. Um, and so this tells us that early childhood actually may be the best period for children to learn alternatives to their aggressive impulses. And that's the time when the brain is really at its peak flexibility for learning. Um, so that suggests that this is the time point, this early childhood time point is the optimal time for intervention for aggression um, because it's a good time point for, for building and learning other skills that can replace those aggressive behaviors. Um, things like language, um, cognitive development, and then social skills that are going to help children learn how to inhibit that instinctual aggressive response that they may have. 
um, and demonstrate more pro-social behaviors. Okay, so we've talked about aggression in the general population, and now I wanna shift gears and talk about aggression and autism. And I'm gonna start with a caveat actually, because even though I think there are a lot of people on the call today, because you may be struggling with these issues um, yourself or in someone that um, is in your family or that you care for. And despite the fact that it's a significant issue, there's been very few large scale studies to understand aggression and autism. And so I think, um, I think it's definitely an issue that, need, that is an urgent issue and needs more um, focused research, especially large scale research. Um, so even though there have been um, not that many large studies, um, there have been smaller scale studies and um, a few large scale studies. And the findings seem to be pretty consistent across all of those research um, studies. And the main findings are that across ages, we're seeing that individuals, children and adults with autism seem to be at higher risk for aggression than the, the general population. And that um, many children with autism are showing some aggression, but that it does appear to decline over time, just as it does in the general population. So as I mentioned, there haven't been that many big studies, but um, there have been a few of those, and there have been a number of smaller scale studies. And we're seeing that prevalence rates have ranged um, anywhere from 10 to 58 percent of the autism population demonstrating aggression, um, but that depends largely on how aggression was defined and the sample and age range that was studied. So this is this reason, um, the fact that there has been not that much research um, sparked an interest in myself and some collaborators um, several years ago. Um, we were working on a project um, to develop an intervention for aggression um, for adolescents with autism. And we were just curious about how common the problem was in the autism population. And at that time, there had not been really any large prevalence studies of aggression. So we decided we wanted to answer that question. And we had the opportunity to look at some data that was collected through the Simon Simplex collection, um, which I think probably many of you participated in um, who are on the call today. And this data provided us a really great opportunity to be able to answer this question because we had over a thousand children and adolescents with autism at that time. And um, this was published in 2011. And it was a really large sample across a wide age range from ages four to 17. And because the study collected lots of data, we were able to look at um, a lot of information about the children's functioning. So we knew a lot about their cognitive abilities, their communication skills, their families, um, as well as their behaviors. So it was a really great sample to be able to look at this first question about how common um, aggression is in the population. And then we also conducted a second study using data from the Autism Treatment Network, um, which many of you may have also participated in that research as well. And that was a slightly larger group of kids um, and included a broader age range all the way down to age two. So from these two studies, we were able to take a snapshot at the prevalence of autism across different ages of children in the samples. So I'm gonna walk through the findings of those studies really quickly now. So the first study is gonna again be reporting on data that was collected through the Simons Foundation. And before I show the graph, I just wanna orient you to what we were looking at. In this study, we asked um, parents to describe their children's behaviors. And one of the questions we asked had to do with whether the child was demonstrating physical aggression towards a caregiver um, at the moment of the study. Um, so the graph is gonna show two different lines. The orange line is gonna show any aggression. So that would include um, probably more than occasional, um, but not really severe levels of aggression all the way up to severe. And then the red dotted line is gonna show levels of definite or significant aggression. And so we took a look at the data and we separated it out by age, looking at four to five year olds, six to eight year olds, um, all the way up to 15 to 17 year olds in the study sample. 
And so what we found was actually really surprising. So more than half of the sample of young kids um, in the study were demonstrating current aggression towards a caregiver at that time. Um, and a very substantial number, um, or close to a third, were also demonstrating significant aggression towards a caregiver. So I want you to think back to that graph of typically developing children. And we would expect to see rates um, closer to two to 5% um, of the sample showing significant aggression. That's what we would expect in the general population. So I think this highlights that aggression is a common issue and it's one that lots of families struggle with um, and lots of individuals may struggle with um, over childhood. So that was the main finding from the um, Simon Simplex collection data. We also took a look at differences between boys and girls. Um, so again, if you think back to that graph of typically developing children, um, in the general population, we expect to see aggression um, occurring much more commonly in boys. And so we were curious about the autism population, given that there are some differences in how girls and boys present symptoms of autism. And so we were, we were very surprised to find that that was not the case. And in fact, if you look at this graph um, of definite physical aggression, the girls in our sample were relatively more likely to show aggression, um, which was again, surprising and something different from what we see in the general population. So this may tell us that there's some differences in underlying mechanisms of aggression in the autism population that could be informative for treatment strategies. Um, so those were the, the main findings, again, from the Simons um, study. And then really briefly, I want to show um, similar kinds of results from the ATN study, which, um, again, was a, a large sample. And in this case, we went all the way down to age two. And aggression in this, in this study was also defined as physical aggression. And we didn't separate out significant serious aggression from occasional aggression in this study. It was really just a question to parents um, as to whether the child was having problems with aggression at the time. And so in this sample, um, again, we found really high rates of aggression um, across ages. And I think you can see here that close to half the sample was showing um, concerns about aggression across those ages. So I think um, the bottom line from these prevalence studies is that it's an important issue and one that I think um, all of us in the field should be thinking carefully about and really thinking hard about how to improve um, functioning for individuals and their families. And I think another reason that I'm really interested in this topic is that aggression can have a really negative impact on the individual themselves and on their family members. Um, and those high prevalence rates highlight again how important the issue it, how important the issue is and the fact that it affects a substantial number of families and children at some point. So when we think about impact on families, um, there's been a lot of research um, on understanding the consequences of aggression. And first of all, we know that physical aggression can lead to physical harm. So it can, can be painful and potentially dangerous especially when we think about those older adolescents who are still demonstrating aggression. Um, toddlers are small, and so it may not be as dangerous for them to be physically aggressive. But as someone ages into adolescence and early adulthood, it can have really significant effects. And you might imagine that would also lead to lots of stress. And so when we've done research to look at predictors of, of family stress and parenting stress, physical aggression and challenging behaviors are often the, the strongest predictors, meaning that they are the most stressful things that families are dealing with in some cases. And so that can lead to lots of um, anxiety and, and also depression. Another aspect of this impact on families is that when a child um, or an individual is demonstrating a lot of aggression, it's really hard for them to be engaged in the community so for many families, it's just not worth it to go out of the home. And they may, as a result of that, feel um, isolated and they may have reduced social support and connection opportunities. Um, it may also be hard for them to find um, respite or caregivers who can come in and help them um, take a break. So that can, again, lead to greater stress and more depression as a result of that as well. And then 
I, I think financial burden is also something that sometimes we don't think about as much, but if a child has really significant aggression, um, the treatment cost may be high, but families may also have to reduce their work hours or maybe take off work because they need to stay home with their child, especially if they're getting called from school and other places to take care of them. So these are pretty significant impacts on families as a whole. And then when we think about teachers and um, direct care staff, they can also experience some of those same outcomes. So the risk of physical harm is there and it can lead to high stress and burnout among staff, which is not gonna be good for the individual either because it's really hard if your teachers are turning over um, a lot and you, you can't develop a good relationship with the same person. Um, so when we think about impact on the the individual, the child or the adult, these behaviors can be harmful to them as well. So it's gonna reduce their opportunities to engage in um, pro-social kind of leisure activities. Um, it may have a really negative impact on their social experiences, which could have um, downstream effects on their mood and functioning. And we also know that aggression can lead to higher um, use of psychotropic medications, higher rates of hospitalization for behavior, um, and sometimes residential and out-of-home placements because of that aggression. So it's something that I think, again, we want to try to really focus on reducing these behaviors before they escalate and trying to get a handle on things um, to minimize these negative outcomes on people and on their families. So now that we've talked um, about definitions and prevalence and impact, I wanna shift gears for the next few minutes and talk about what we know about the causes of aggression and some theories of aggression. And again, I'm gonna start this with a caveat that even though aggression is a really significant issue for many children with autism and their families, um, there have been surprisingly few research studies to actually understand what is causing this at a me mechanistic level and what the underlying mechanisms might be. Um, on the other hand, aggression has been the focus of a lot of research in the general population um, for a number of years. And that's been done across both human and animal studies. And so we've got a lot of really great information from psychology research to neuroscience and um, medicine um, in general focused on aggression. So what I'd like to do for you now is to actually spend a bit of time touching on these primary theories from the general aggression um, research. And then we can think together about how they might apply or be helpful when we think about aggression and autism. So the first of these kinds of theories when we think about um, etiology and factors that might explain why aggression is occurring um, are actually biological. So we know that there are, um, from the general aggression research, there can be a genetic predisposition to aggression and some genes have been linked to um, having a greater risk for um, aggression. So it doesn't mean if you have that genetic predisposition, you're always gonna show aggression, but it means that you may be more likely to have that risk. And then the second biological factor that seems to be at play has to do with brain function. So we know from this general aggression research that um, some specific areas of the brain have been linked to aggressive behaviors. And two of the ones I wanna talk about right now um, are brain regions that help us regulate emotions and behaviors. So the first of those is the amygdala, which you may have heard of some links between um, some findings in the autism research focused on the amygdala, but this is really thinking about how it may relate to aggression. Um, the amygdala is the part of the brain that helps us coordinate responses to things in our environment and especially things that trigger an emotional response. So this is the brain structure that's going to play a really important role in both fear and anger. And it's activated in response to both positive and negative stimuli. Um, and it's especially activated in response to things that we see as threatening. So you can imagine how that might play a role in aggression. And this brain region is considered to be kind of an old part of the brain, and it has connections to lots and lots of other body systems and brain systems related to emotions, um, including the sympathetic nervous system, 
which kind of makes up our fight or flight response. Um, it also has connections to things like facial expressions and to the release of neurotransmitters or brain chemicals related to stress and aggression. And the amygdala is also connected to lots of other regions of the brain. Um, so when it actually stim stimulates another area called the hypothalamus, um, it initiates this fight or flight response that I talked about. And that's gonna send a signal to produce hormones like adrenal adrenaline and cortisol, which helps get your body prepared for fight or flight. And so I think we've all experienced this rush of emotions and rush of adrenaline when things have been threatening to us. And when that happens, um, when those hormones enter your bloodstream, you're gonna probably notice some physical changes that happen pretty quickly, like an increase in heart rate, um, an increase in breathing, and other kind of body changes that help your body prepare for action. And so, I think the link between this response and an aggressive reaction is, can be pretty clear. So if there's something going on that makes um, your brain function a little bit differently, um, it may make it more likely to, for you to behave uh, um, and respond aggressively to environmental stimuli. So then the other brain um, area that I just wanna mention from, again, from the general aggression research is called the prefrontal cortex. And this is the part of your brain that is responsible for what we call executive functions. And that, are, that includes things like planning or paying attention or solving problems. Um, but it also helps us control and inhibit our behavior. And so this relates to aggression because um, we're finding that this neural connection between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex is kind of a control center for aggression. And so when this connection is more activated, um, we are better able to control our aggressive impulses. Um, so I think these two brain regions are really important to think about with aggression. And interestingly, um, like I mentioned before, the research in autism has found some differences in, in both of these brain regions in people with autism, which may help explain why they may be um, at increased risk for aggressive responses at a biological level. Okay, so we've talked about genes and brain function. Um, there's also a role in the general aggression research on, uh, for hormones and neurotransmitters. So for example, um, really high levels of testosterone have been linked to aggression, which may be why we see um, boys being at higher risk for aggression than girls. And then on the other side of the coin, serotonin, or what we think of as the feel-good neurotransmitter, um, actually inhibits aggression. And so we found some evidence for low levels of serotonin being linked to greater reactive aggression. So these are some of the basic kind of biological mechanisms we think about in aggression, both in human and animal studies. And then uh, moving up a little bit, still focused on biology, but um, a little bit higher level, we know that there are some physiological factors that can play a role as well. And so those are gonna be things like um, physiological arousal. Um, when we talked about the fight or flight response that relates to that. So we know that when people have increased heart rate and blood pressure, they may be more likely to behave aggressively especially the reactive aggressive type. Um, and we can also uh, find a link between physical discomfort and aggressive response. And so um, I think we can probably all identify with this experience. If you can think of a time when um, maybe you stubbed your toe or you, you hit your thumb with a hammer and most of us feel a flash of anger or irritation and feel like lashing out, um, even if the person next to you isn't the reason that you um, have that experience. And so this is also um, the case for things like heat or being in pain or being in crowded situations um, or having other kind of aversive stimuli, it can trigger an aggressive response. And so in experimental studies in psychology, when people are exposed to painful or unpleasant things, um, like having your hand submerged in ice cold water, um, those participants in those studies are more likely to behave aggressively towards other people, um, even innocent bystanders. 
So it's really showing this link between aversive, unpleasant um, sensations and aggression. Um, and we've also found in places where the temperature is hotter, we see higher rates of aggressive crimes um, and other kind of environmental irritants like bad odors or air pollution have also been linked to aggression. So um, you can see how this, these factors may actually apply pretty closely for people with autism who may be especially sensitive to sensory input. So it could be that um, they may be more likely to experience physical discomfort in situations that may not be uncomfortable for other people. And then it may have a resulting effect on their arousal and their ability to um, calm themselves back down. So um, we've talked now about biological theories of aggression from the general literature. Um, there are also some or behavioral theories that I think are really important to think about as well. And the first of those is um, the behavioral principle of operant learning, um, which dates back to the early work of B.F. Skinner from the 1950s. Um, and this theory really holds that behaviors are maintained or are a function of the consequences that follow them. And it's actually the basis for most of our effective behavioral treatment strategies that we use today and the basis of ABA treatment strategies. So this is a really important psychological theory that's been applied to um, interventions that um, are very effective. Additional theories um, just from the general aggression literature that I think are helpful to think about are um, observational learning or social learning, um, which has the idea that we can learn to behave aggressively just by watching other people. And so there were some early studies by Bandura from the 1970s where children were observing someone else act aggressively toward a doll and then um, they learned to do that just by watching and imitating. Um, and then more recent theories from the psychology literature have focused on um, social thinking or information processing. And so within this model, um, aggression may be the result of how you're interpreting information. Um, so if you think back to talking about reactive aggression and the fact that some people may perceive things as being hostile or threatening, um, that may be the result of how they're perceiving social information. And over time, they may be, begin to show um, scripts or ways of thinking that guide their behavior in a more aggressive way. So these specific theories, I think, are important, and they're all a little bit different in their emphasis. So modern theories of aggression um, have combined them together um, and tied these theories um, to one another into a single model. And so this can be thought of as a general aggression model or a meta theory. And I kind of like this model because I think visually it helps us to see um, how all of these factors may relate to one another and may interact with one another over time for a person. So you can see here at the top, um, there are personal variables that may play a role. And those may include the things we just talked about, like genetic predisposition, brain function, um, hormones and neurotransmitters. Um, but also situational variables. So that would include things like sensory stimuli in the environment or being provoked by somebody else or being frustrated. Um, it could also include the social context. So if somebody is in an environment where aggression is happening a lot um, and they're exposed to violence, that's gonna be a situational variable that may affect their behavior. So these two things together are gonna affect um, this middle box here that includes um, thoughts, feelings, and sort of physical arousal. And in, within this model, um, you can think about the ideas of how you're interpreting a situation. Um, it's gonna change how you feel about it, and it may also affect your physiological arousal. And so it's sort of a feedback loop. And I think this is helpful from a treatment perspective because it means that we might be able to target any one of those variables and make an impact on aggression. Um, so once a person has demonstrated ag aggressive behavior in this model, um, they're going to have a social encounter because aggression, you know, by its nature is a social behavior. Um, and in that encounter, they may be 
reinforced for their aggression. So it may result in something positive for them. So that's going to affect their learning and they may be more likely to demonstrate aggression in the future. Um, or the encounter may be negative. So they may um, have a negative consequence for their behavior or they may not have access to what they wanted. And so that will then feed back into that loop um, and make it more or less likely for aggression to occur in the future. Um, so again, I think this meta theory, even though it's not specific to autism, it can be pretty helpful when we think about treatment strategies. Um, for example, if a person has a biological pre predisposition to um, having trouble regulating their arousal, we might be able to target that specific factor within the model, and we might be able to help them learn um, strategies to relax or to de-escalate their arousal. Um, that can be done through behavioral strategies, or there could be a medication that could help with that as well. And so if somebody has an improved regulation, that might give us just the window of time we need to help them calm down um, before their anger escalates and they start to show aggression. Um, on the other hand, if the cognition is the main driver here and the person tends to just misinterpret things as being hostile towards them, we might be able to help them change the ways that they're thinking um, that's going to lead them to greater emotional control. So there's a couple of ways that we might be able to target that. Um, and then finally, we can also think about things in the environment that may make it more or less likely for aggression to be triggered. So if we think about the situational or social encounter variables, um, we can change how we respond to aggression to make it less likely to occur. And so those are gonna be more behavioral or ABA types of strategies that we could use. So um, now that we've looked at this complex model, I wanna talk a little bit now about what we know in autism. So again, this was a general model that I think can apply to autism. Um, and I wanna share a few results from studies that have been done in the autism population. Um, so the first thing that I wanna talk about are some studies that have looked at factors that place people at greater risk for aggression um, in the autism population. And so these are results from some of the studies that we've done. Um, that my collabor collaborators and I have worked on over the past few years. And consistently, the results of those studies have shown that aggression is really highly related to um, both self-injurious behavior or harming yourself and repetitive behaviors. Um, so for people who have really intense repetitive behaviors like stereotyped movements um, or rituals, um, they may be showing a greater tendency to aggression. And then also for children who need to have things done exactly the same way or want to do things in a ritualized way, um, if those rituals are interrupted, it may lead to agitation and aggression as well. Um, and the third group of factors here um, across these studies that we've done have been sensory problems. And so I think that is consistent with what we talked about just a few minutes ago when we think about how um, sensory stimuli that are experienced as aversive um, are really strongly linked to aggression um, in both humans and animals. And so if children or adults on the spectrum have just a lot of aversive sensory input and they're really over um, responsive to that, uh, that may be a trigger for aggression for them. So it may be an, an area that we wanna really help them um, to deal with. So in addition to these kind of primary features that we see when we think about autism, um, we also know that people on the spectrum experience a lot of other co-occurring health and mental health conditions. And so some of our studies have looked at how those conditions may relate to behavior. And the primary finding that we found across several studies is that um, especially for children um, with autism, when they experience sleep problems, um, including not just not getting enough sleep or having poor quality sleep or waking up a lot at night, those problems are related to um, aggressive behavior during the day. Um, and I think, you know, for most of us, 
if we don't sleep well at night, we feel pretty irritated and it's hard to regulate your behavior. And that's definitely the case um, in autism. And so because we know that sleep problems and insomnia are so common um, in this group, I think it's really important if your child or if you are experiencing sleep problems, that that be a primary target and try to improve sleep. And you may see some um, positive benefits on, on behavior the next day as a result of that. Um, we've also found links between um, GI problems, seizures, and anxiety um, to aggression and autism. And I think it fits within this model, kind of in the personal variables level, um, and it may lead to physical discomfort that could make aggression more likely. Um, and then finally, we've also found that when we think about those two types of aggression, reactive and proactive, that in our studies of autism, we seem to see a much greater likelihood of this impulsive reactive subtype. Um, so that's telling us that it may be arousal um, and some of the cognitive mis misinterpretations that we need to focus on um, more so than the proactive subtype that I talked about. Um, and that's also consistent with some studies that have shown um, that for people with autism who have trouble regulating arousal and regulating their emotions, aggression seems to be more common. So those are some of the um, findings that are emerging out of the research on aggression and autism. And for the last few minutes of the talk today, I wanna to talk about how this applies to assessment and treatment. Um, we've talked just a little bit about that, especially in thinking about that general aggression model. Um, but I wanna share some information and resources at the end of the talk for you um, that will hopefully be helpful for this. So the, the first thing that I wanna mention is that um, when we're thinking about dealing with aggression in a child or an adult with, adult with autism, the treatment plan needs to really start with a very careful assessment um, because we know there, there's multiple factors that could be related to aggression, just as we talked about. Um, so you wanna think very carefully about safety and making sure that we're um, maintaining safety. We wanna understand the nature and severity of aggression to know whether we might wanna to go to a higher level of care. Um, and then you wanna also rule out any possible contributors like those medical conditions that I just talked about that could be addressed um, in addition to focusing on the behavior itself. And in general, our treatment approach is really gonna be comprehensive. So we wanna make sure that we're addressing the whole person and that we are being person-centered and family-centered um, in the approach. Um, Typically, behavioral and psychosocial interventions are going to be our first line um, of defense. And then there are some pharmacological or medical treatment options that can be considered as a secondary choice. Um, so when we think about behavioral and psychosocial interventions, those are the things that are going to help the person um, learn some new skills to replace their aggressive behaviors. Um, they're also going to help people who support them develop strategies that can prevent the behavior from occurring um, and teach new behaviors. So these are the, again, the first line, first options that we wanna try. Um, if those are not helpful or if safety is a major concern, um, medication can be considered as well. And so I wanna just say that I'm a psychologist and not a physician, so I'm not gonna be making any medication recommendations, but there are two medications that have been approved by the FDA um, for treatment of irritability and autism. And irritability here does include aggression. And so those are um, listed here. And I'll just mention that um, they do, for, for many people, have significant side effects. So it's definitely something that you'll want to consult really closely with your physician and make sure that these medications are used as part of a comprehensive family-centered treatment plan and that you're um, making decisions along, alongside your healthcare providers with this. Um, so because we know that behavioral interventions are kind of our first line um, treatment and because they have a lot of evidence, I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about um, what we mean when we, we use the term behavioral interventions. Um, so these again are gonna be based on that operant learning theory that I mentioned earlier. And it's really based on the science of learning and behavior. 
um, with a focus on understanding behavior and how it's affected by the environment. And by the, the, the term environment here really means people, places, or things. And these behavioral interventions use those kinds of principles to, meet, to bring about positive change in behavior. And so they're gonna help us change what, the happens, what happens before a child's behavior or after a child's behavior in order to see more or less of it in the future. So this process really needs to start with a careful assessment of behavior um, to figure out what the factors are that can may be causing and maintaining it. And so typically that will be a functional behavior assessment in most cases. And that's gonna include a variety of things like interviewing caregivers, teachers, um, or the individual, sometimes direct observation, and then even sometimes testing behavior in different conditions. And so this component, this assessment component is really critical because it's gonna help us decide what interventions are gonna work the best. And to do that, we have to know what's causing a behavior um, and how to change it. So I'm sure probably a lot of you on the call today are already familiar with these kind of ABCs of behavior, but they're really critical to, uh, to implementing behavioral interventions. And so they're gonna include things like the situation um, or context that may increase or decrease behavior. And then the A is going to be the antecedent, the thing that comes right before the behavior. The B is the behavior itself, which today refers to aggression because that's what we're talking about today. Um, and C in this model is the consequence or the thing that happens right after a behavior. So if you have a good understanding of the ABCs of behavior, that can help you understand the purpose of it. And in general, when we think about behavioral interventions and kind of this theory of behavior, the functions can be either to get something or to avoid something, just to really simplify it. Um, so a, somebody might have an aggressive behavior to get access to a toy that they want, or it might be their way to get attention. It might be um, their way to get sensory input or access to food. So in this case, the function would be to get something, um, or it could be to avoid something. And so it could be to avoid that negative sensory input or to avoid an unpleasant task or things like that. So you can see that if you understand that function, it's gonna make a difference in terms of the types of treatment strategies you select. So some of those strategies might be focused on changing the antecedent um, so that you can prevent the aggression from occurring. Um, so you might wanna remove some triggers in the environment or you might wanna set up things in the environment to make the positive behavior more likely. And so some examples here that um, you may be familiar with are things like visual supports or offering choices or setting up the environment in a way that prompts positive behavior. And then on the other side, you may wanna use a, a consequence to help promote a more positive behavior and kind of remove that consequence from the aggressive behavior. And so in this case, we're gonna really try to reinforce positive replacement behaviors um, or potentially teach communication skills if the child needs to have more adaptive ways to ask for help or to ask for access um, to something that they want. So these are very effective strategies um, that focus again on those behavioral principles. Um, I want to just quickly wrap up with some, just mentioning some other intervention approaches that are emerging and have some uh, promising evidence. Um, one is parent training and parent implemented strategies um, that focus on behavior. There's a growing um, evidence base that parents can do a great job of being coached to deliver these behavioral interventions in the natural environment. And that's actually great because it really helps access um, to the interventions and it helps to generalize skills that kids are learning. Um, there's also some good evidence emerging now focused on the cognitive aspect. If you think back to this little diagram here, um, that CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy can help te teach people um, to change their thoughts and behaviors that make it less likely for them to be angry um, and help them to um, regulate their own emotions. Um, and then 
I'll just mention quickly that we have some, some research on this multi-systemic therapy model, which is a much more comprehensive and an intensive family-based um, therapy approach for, for aggression. Um, we've published a couple of papers on this approach for people with autism, but a lot more research needs to be done in autism specifically, even though it's an effective approach in the general population. Um, I'm looking at the time and realizing that we're getting close to being out of time, and I want to end with sharing some resources that I think could be helpful, including some previous Spark webinars that have focused on really practical strategies for addressing challenging behaviors. Um, I'd also like to mention that our Autism Drive resource directory, um, which is linked here, has a number of both videos and online resources focused on challenging behaviors. Um, and then I've listed some other um, options here. So Vincent, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. I'm sorry, I took a little bit longer than I planned. Uh, no worries, no worries. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, we maybe only have time for about one question. Uh, a lot of questions that we got in were really specific to, um, act, you know, uh, families and, and their children and, and their specific experience. So unfortunately, we can't really answer those. But let me try to give you one that's a bit more broad. Um, someone was asking uh, if you think that parents of girls with autism have a perception of acceptability of aggression that may have influenced um, their report of aggression versus a true difference in aggression prevalence in girls versus boys with autism. That's a really interesting question. Um, I think there is certainly a difference in how we socialize girls and boys in terms of what behavior is acceptable. And so that is definitely a possibility that parents may have a lower threshold for um, describing something as being aggressive um, in girls versus boys because of that. Um, I think that would be an interesting research topic actually. So I'm glad that um, someone suggested that as an idea definitely interesting. Yeah, I thought that was interesting as well. Um, so we're, we're going to have to wrap things up here. Um, but uh, we had some questions about treatments. Um, we do have a really informative webinar on our website about treatments and autism. So feel free to check that out. If you still have additional questions. Um, we do hold um, webinars monthly. And so we might actually address some of these questions in, in another month. And uh, we have articles on a variety of topics on our website as well. Uh, and we have a new search feature. So hopefully we can um, help you with, with questions um, that way. So um, thank you again, Dr. Masaryk. This was really great. We got a lot of good feedback.